All right. Maybe you take me more seriously without a leotard on, so <laughs> my other shirt, I had a polo. I don't know, I decided to wear it under the leotard and that it wasn't a good idea, and so I found another shirt. You know, it's blue ones back there for $7 if you haven't got one yet. Uh, it says, The Greatest Story on Earth and Kel Keller Church of Christ uh, on the back. But uh, the, that was a good song, the fitting song to start this lesson off. I was thinking about day one where it says in the song, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men. Day two, the life of Jesus. It continues, my example is he living, he loved me. So Ed had an hour to cover the entire life of Jesus, all the teachings, all the miracles, all the parables. You got a very thorough overview of the life of Christ. And now we'll be looking tonight at the death of the burial and the resurrection. The song continued uh, saying, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. And then tomorrow, Corey will conclude our greatest, the greatest story on earth, in heaven and on earth, to be honest. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. So the return of Jesus will be tomorrow night. But we, I have basically two ways of breaking this up, and we're going to read the scriptures together. I hope that this will be, uh, I have enjoyed uh, preparing for this class. Uh, a while back, maybe two years ago, I did a very thorough study of Matthew, and I basically put all my notes in my Bible, so they were always with, with me wherever I went, and, uh, and I just hope I don't ever lose this Bible, but they're, they're here ready to go. So I'm just looking forward to reading Matthew 26 through 28, and, uh, but we're going to have lots of commentary, lots of explanation, trying to bring and paint this picture. I believe Matthew does a great job explaining the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. The idea will be then to really spend the last part. I love this presentation on the resurrection. I believe it's very important that we be able to give a defense for the hope that's within us and being able to explain that the resurrection was not something that was a hoax or something that was a fictional event. It is indeed something that was fact and something that is history. And so I'll try, if we get to it, which we have plenty of time apparently to talk, uh, and we should be able to share um, a presentation I have on the resurrection. So let me get my clicker, and we will I think we're ready. All right. So Matthew 26, uh, the, you know, the Bible says, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Sometimes we read five or six verses uh, on, a, um, on a Sunday morning. Chapter 26 alone has 75 verses. 27 has, let's see, 66 verses, and 28 has 20 verses. Um, so I hope that you will open your Bibles up. Um, I'm going to be sharing uh, lots of like other verses that go with that particular uh, part of Scripture. What I like about having Matthew and Mark and Luke and John's account of the same one gospel, we have it from four different points of view, you have lots of supplementation, meaning the story in Matthew, which is rich and it's full, has more details when you consider Mark and Luke's and John's account of the story in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'll be kind of tying in references if you want to jot those down, and I'll be throwing in some comments from the Old Testament, uh, some references of why something was happening, which is real fitting because Matthew is writing to a, a primarily a Jewish audience. And so he's really making the case that Jesus is the Messiah of the Old Testament. He's this one for 400 years plus that we've been waiting for. He is the, uh, the one that, you know, Elijah had to come first in preparing the way of the Lord. And John the Baptist ha has done that. He prepared the way for Jesus. And the kingdom of heaven was, was near. And then the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And then the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be happening all here within a short period of time. And so we're going to start right after what's assumed the life of Christ is about over now, and now we're going to get to the end, the last few uh, days of the life of Christ. So there's this plot to kill Jesus we'll be starting with in Matthew chapter 26. And when Jesus had finished all of these sayings, what sayings about parables, about right before this in chapter 25, showing us what the judgment scene would look like, right after those sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days... The Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Anytime I read these kind of phrases and these comments, like during the life of Christ, I've always wondered, like, how did the disciples not understand or get what was saying, being, being said to them? I know in hindsight, which Matthew would be written, you know, 50, 60 AD, they would go back and be like, oh, yeah, Jesus did say that multiple times to us. And he gave us lots of clues, and he told us that I, he would be crucified. But he's telling them it's, it's imminent. It's going to be happening. 
And in verse, this is actually the fourth time, I won't go over all of them, the fourth time where he's made this prediction of his crucifixion. And then in verse 3, then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. Caiaphas, this would be around 30, 30 to about 36 AD, somewhere in this, this range. And they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. But they said, well, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So this whole thing is going to be crooked. This whole business of getting Jesus is going to be shady. It's going to be very corrupt how this whole thing is going to go down. It's not going to be pretty. It, it, it does not look good uh, from the Jewish point of view when you're reading uh, the, the leaders at the time, when you read this account. Uh, Luke 22, verse 2, kind of gives us more insight about this fear of the people. You know, why are they afraid of, of arresting Jesus and uh, broad daylight during a, a Passover feast when, you know, right before this, they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, salvation is, is here. And so uh, they don't want to do it during the feast, uh, and probably because maybe their conscience was a little pierced too, that maybe, you know, something maybe not right about what we're doing. Um, so look in verse 6. When, now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment and she poured it on the head as he reclined at table uh, mark would tell us this would be worth of about a whole year's wages super expensive super um this is a very sacrificial gift that mary is is doing for uh for jesus and of course judas who's going to have the right motive no i don't think he is is not going to like what's happening in verse number eight and when the disciples saw it they were indignant saying why this waste now, Judas, John 12 talks about this, where Judas wasn't liking what was going on. It even says, you know, he, you know, he has those inner motives of more of a thief type motives. In verse 9, for this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will, al- you will not always have uh, me in pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial, which I'm going to make a lot of these comments. This was prophecy. This was prophecy. This was prophecy. Like within a 24-hour period of time, 30 prophecies are going to be fulfilled, 30 d- direct prophecies, let alone some indirect prophecies that are happening. But one of the prophecies is like this king, this richly king-type burial that Jesus is going to have when we start reading about what Joseph of Arimathea would do here in a little bit. So uh, we are in verse 13. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So it's now July 30th, 2019. And guess what story we're talking about? We're talking about this woman and how she poured this very expensive ointment, alabaster, uh, on on her, uh, on Jesus. And we're still talking about it. Thousands of years later, she made... The, the book. She made the scripture. She made the cut for the final version of, of the Bible. And if everything had been recorded, actually, John tells us, if everything that Jesus had did and said and taught uh, was recorded, the whole book couldn't contain all the, all the books that, of what Jesus did. So she made it. She made it in the scriptures. And we're talking about her sacrifice and what she did to prepare Jesus for his imminent burial that will be happening very soon. Verse 14 Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity uh, to uh, betray him. And so this would be a prophecy. Like I mentioned, I'm going to throw in some of these prophecy moments. Uh, Psalm 41, verse 9. You're going to have this Psalm 41, verse 9, talks about a friend who's going to betray him, a friend who's going to lift up his, his heel. You know, many of you have read this before, and if you're any Bible reading plan or been a Christian for any amount of time, and even today, just rereading it twice today, once we were at the Tarrant County Jail studying with uh, some of the inmates, and we were just reading the crucifixion together. And, uh, and I told them, you know, every time I read this, it just shows again what Jesus did. It's, it's always fresh. It's always exciting. It's always new. But even there's certain things that stick out to me because I think about the prophecy in Psalm 41, verse 9, a friend who has lifted up his heel against me. Well, later on when I'm kind of fast forwarding, if you haven't heard the gospel before, but Judas is going to betray Jesus and Jesus is going to address him as friend. Do what you've got. And I thought, wow, 
This, why, why even use that word friend? I know he loves his enemies and he was one of his disciples, but was that intentionally said friend because it's a reference to Psalm 41 verse 9? There's some cool little, little tidbits that maybe I'm looking more into it than I need to, but I believe there's something uh, possibly there. Okay, how did I get there? We're in verse 14, talking about Judas. Here we go. Uh, Judas Iscariot, and he said, what will you give me? And he's going to, uh, this is a Zechariah 11 verse 12 prophecy. If you're writing these down for the pop quiz later on, Zechariah 11:12, 12, I made the prophecy that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, which actually goes all the way back to the law of Moses. The price of a slave was worth, in Exodus 21, verse 32, 30 pieces of silver. And so it goes all the way back to that. Okay, uh, verse 17. Now on the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city for a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Sometimes I wonder, was this like a prearranged thing that Jesus had? Like, hey, when you hear some of my followers say the teacher, that's, you know, the rabbi, the teacher, he, he's here in, to do the Passover. That could have been some rearranged thing. Jesus obviously had a reputation. So when they hear, yeah, Jesus wants a place to go. Yeah, I'll, let's go here. And also during the Passover, historically, I understand that people are, were very hospitable. And, and there's lots of people that were always in the area during that time of the year. So it was very customary for people to have people in their homes and to open their homes up. But nevertheless, here's what's happening. Verse 19, the disciples did as Jesus had directed him, and they prepared the Passover. Exodus 12, verse 8, talking about this preparation of the Passover. And when it was the evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And this is where the whole John 13 scenes, the scene takes place, the washing of the disciples' feet. All this happens here, but we don't actually read about it in Matthew's account. We read about it in John's account. And as they were eating, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And that wouldn't be a fun conversation to be reclining at the table to hear the Lord say that. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to one another, uh, is it I, Lord? Like it's more in the Greek, it's more like the negative. No, it's not me. Who, me? No. And, and um, we don't read about it here, but, but John would get the intel that, oh, it's Judas is going to be the one who's going to betray me. And Jesus said in verse 23, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. And that's not the first time we're going to see an answer to a question uh, like this. It's kind of a, what you would call a Hebrew idiom, another way of saying yes, it's an affirmative statement. Yes, you have said so. As you've said, that's right. And later on, like Jesus will be, you know, interrogated and asked, you know, are you the son of man? You've said so. He, he speaks in this affirmative type way. I, I wish I compared to some other translation. Actually, uh, what, what do you have for verse 25 as the answer that Jesus gave uh, to that question that Judas had? You have said it yourself. Any other translations? <laughs> as said as you. So, Yes. Okay, in verse 26, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This is obviously read often during our Lord's Supper time. Uh, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I'll not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And I got four sermons there we could talk about, but we're going to move on. Ready? Verse 30. Verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Uh, and then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, and you're only going to have mostly Matthew doing this, making, like quoting something in the Old Testament. The book of Mark won't do this as often because the Romans don't really care about Hebrew prophecy. Uh, the Luke, right, to more of a Gentile audience, didn't care as much about this. John, you know, it's further in time and it's for everybody. But this really meant something here. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That's uh, Zechariah 13 in verse number 7. So our good shepherd's going to be um, uh, struck 
and the sheep are going to scatter. All, this is so many, this is probably a deeper conversation I intend to do right now, but did people understand that they were, they were the people of prophecy? They were on their own free will doing what was written about seven to 1,000 years prior. I mean, they're, 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 the, they're part of this whole foreknowledge of God, seeing what would play out in the prophecy that's taking place. And so all this is happening um, in, in live time here. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee, which, by the way, the angel in uh, Mark 16, verse 17, after the resurrection, again, a spoiler, he is going to rise again in a little bit. But uh, after that happens, the angel is going to say, remember, he told you he would go and see you in Galilee. He would go before you in Galilee. So the angel will quote this same thing that Jesus is saying right now. In verse 33, Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Very emphatic with that, I will never fall away. And in one sense, we tend to beat up Peter a little bit. Uh, I even, I think I wrote out to my notes, seems very sincere <laughs> just from my reading it. Peter seemed like he really meant it. A few verses later, it's gonna, you're going to wonder if he really had meant it when you see this denial uh, taking place. But uh, he, I, he, I believe he was going to, well, it doesn't say it here, he would say he'd even die. Yeah, let's keep reading. Truly I tell you, verse 34, this very night before the rooster, uh, rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to them, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples did the same. Kind of the, the leader of the pack there, the vocal leader. Hey, we're going we're to die for you. And, and I believe they, they sort of meant it, like intellectually. And then when the going really go, <laughs> gets going, uh, they're going to be put to the test and see if they're going to, to stay firm to this uh, commitment that they're, they're pledging. Any comments so far? Because I've just cruised through 35 verses, half of Matthew 26, which is really just the intro to the main lesson. <laughs> Yes. Peter is his man. Right there. Yes. He walked on water, though. <laughs> yeah. He is still only human. Yeah. I, Peter is uh, truly inspirational. We're going to make a comparison later on between Peter and Judas. And when they messed up, how did they respond to their messed upness? <laughs> and uh, Peter does it the right way. I'll just say that. Okay. Verse 36. When, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. That's the place of oil presses, literally. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go, go over there and pray. Now, we're going to read some little prayers here. It's going to be a very intense scene. Uh, you're going to have, not here, but in John 17, during the same scene, you have a, a longest recorded prayer of Jesus, what they call the high priestly prayer. That all happens right here, too. And so you have this place. And Judas... Uh, would know about this spot. Remember all the way back in, uh, in verse number uh, something, 16, from that moment he saw an opportunity to betray him. He, he wanted them not with a big crowd, not during this, where people could see it, not during a big feast, but when it would be in a, a more desolate, isolated place. In Luke 22, verse 39, this would be a regular place, a customary place where Jesus would go for prayer. So Judas this would know about this spot. And he's going to be on his way here in a moment. And after, in taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And, and this, I mean, we read it, it took, took five seconds to read that verse. But that, there's so much there. I believe there's so much to that. I, I wrote down in my scriptures, from, the human, from a human perspective, this is tough. I mean, he knows that he's about to go through a Roman a scourging that most people, many people died even from that, let alone the, the crucifixion and the being nailed up and, the, and the, the crown of thorns and the beating and the mocking and the spitting. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be terrible. It's literally going to be, as the Genesis 3.15 prophecy says, that even though Jesus is going to crush the head of Satan, it's going to bruise the heel. Uh, and, and it's not going to be super easy, a walk in the park. This is, this is very tough. And from his humanity point of view, uh, he's going to even ask it three times here. You know, be your will, let this cut pass from me. But it's not God's will. It's God's will that this had to, this had to happen, though. This, this whole crucifixion thing has to happen. It's the only way for all of it to flow and to make sense and for forgiveness to even to be, to be offered. But, and, and so we see from a human point of view how difficult this was for Jesus. 
And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. We're talking, uh, um, I don't believe it's Matthew's account where there, he's like sweating drops of blood. That's the intensity. And I always sometimes picture like the Gatorade commercials, but there's actually a, a scientific explanation about what's happening at, at that moment. Uh, and it says, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup, this, this cup of suffering, Matthew 20, verse 22, uh, pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Wow, what a good lesson for our prayers. You know, <laughs> if it be your will, but I understand if it's not your will, your will be done. And then in verse 40, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And so he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me uh, one hour? And uh, when we look at the time here later, it's, this is, is going to be all really late at night, really dark, and you kind of get where they're coming from because they don't get it. I don't think they get how imminent this is about to get. Uh, and then it says in uh, verse 41, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak and I think Corey did a whole series on Sunday nights for a while about this inner war, this inner warfare, and this spirit-flesh battle that if you're striving to live for the Lord, you know how real that, that, that battle is, that spirit and flesh. Uh, read Romans 7 and Romans 8 sometime and look at the compare and contrast about that battle, that war within us. In verse 42, again, for the second time, he went and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went up and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. I've always said that it's okay to say the same words in a prayer. Jesus did it. As long as you sincerely mean what you're saying and how you say it. Uh, then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners, and imagine waking up to this. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. That, that wouldn't be fun to wake up to. The betrayal taking place, and Jesus doesn't run. Jesus, I believe, could have run. Jesus could have, he, he can do a lot here. There, later on, he's going to talk about calling legions, six, 12 legions of, of angels, which is if I understand right, a legion was 6,000, so 6 times 12, like 72,000, which we probably need to change the lyrics to that song. He could have called 72,000 angels to destroy the world and set them free. Okay, he could have, so much could have happened. Actually, early on, earlier on in Jesus' ministry, there were different times when they either tried to attack him type thing and he got away from it, or it was a time to, they wanted to make him the king right then and there, but his time had not yet come. And so he... I believe he could have got away out of it if he really wanted to. When Peter pulls out his sword later. He could have said, yeah, go to town, defend me. But this has to happen. This all has to happen. It has to be everyone doing what they think they need to do and so much prophecy being fulfilled. And Jesus later on, like he, like he won't speak because he realizes the prophecy says he's not supposed to be speaking. He knows what has to be done for this to all work out the way that God from creation has, has planned for this to, to work. Okay, in verse 47, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests to the elders of the people. Verse 48, now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Behold, one of those who was with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. I tend to use this verse sometimes as another side thought when talking about uh, how to address uh, alleged discrepancies or contradictions in Scripture, because people will look at different accounts and say, well, it's different in this account than it is in this account. And I, and I just refer to that more as scripture supplementation. It's giving a bigger picture. Because when you look at Mark, Luke, and John, you actually know which disciple it was. Who was it? Peter, who's a zealot, who has a sword typically on him. And he cut off, was it the left ear or right ear? John tells us. <laughs> the right ear. And we actually know the name of the guy, too. 
<laughs> Malchus. So like Malchus, and when we put all of it together, you get a fuller picture. So and, and later on, like when Peter is um, denying Jesus uh, later on in this chapter, uh, the third time he's, I'm kind of skipping ahead, being asked, hey, you, you're one of, you're with Jesus. And it was actually a relative of Malchus, who's the one who just got his right ear cut off by Peter. I mean, it's crazy, all of it, how it connects. And, and this, this is the things that makes me all giddy. I don't know why, when you put all these pieces together and, and, and the scripture comes to life. Where were we at? Okay, verse 52. Then Jesus asked him, uh, put your, said to him, uh, put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he at once will send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? It's like Jesus said, he knows this, this has to happen. That's what he's saying. This has to happen. He knows the scriptures inside and out. Jesus knows the word so much that, I mean, later earlier when he's during his ministry, he reads a part of scripture in the synagogue and he goes, today, this has been fulfilled. Like he knows it's about him. He knows that it's what I call the mic drop moment. He like just goes and sits down. Everyone's astonished at his teaching at what's happening. And, and it's amazing here. And so he knows that this has to happen. In verse 55, at that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching. You did not seize me. In other words, this is shady, guys. This isn't cool what you're doing. And you know it. Verse 56. But all that has taken place, this has taken place, the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all, look, here it goes. Then all the disciples left him and fled. That's prophesied a couple times. His disciples leave. A couple will follow. One will follow from a distance. A younger guy will follow until he gets, you know, his linen cloth taken off of him and then runs the other way. But they're going to leave him. It's not, it's not good. Very, very dark scene that's about to take place. Any more comments as we've gotten almost through one chapter? Oh, it's, is that clock right? It's right. Okay. So nobody has a comment. That's good because we got to keep going. Okay. We're going to kind of skip 57 through 68, but there's, there's something really cool there. I do want to read one verse here. Uh, let me, let me kind of summarize it. So they're, they're, tr- they're doing all these illegal trials. In the bottom of my Bible, I have six ways that there are violations being committed under even Jewish law about how this was a very unjust process, unjust trial. Everything is corrupt about what's, what's happening here to the point where they're pr- trying to bring in false witnesses. And by the way, the scripture tells us in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, and in 19, verse 15 of Deuteronomy, a false witness would be put to death. And they keep, ah, you, that's not a good testimony. Oh, that's not good. Let me interview you separately instead of together, uh, or together instead of separately, the way it should have been. And, and they finally find two witnesses who kind of have a story that has a little bit of truth to it, that Jesus would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. That is true, but he was referring to what, though? His body, which John uh, chapter uh, 2 or 3 it explains uh, more, more fully to his chapter 2, verse 19. And so they kind of get some testimony. And then here's the big deal. Here's where it gets, where, where Jesus is silent. He doesn't answer. Verse 62. Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? He doesn't answer because he has to not answer. It's prophecy. But then he does answer. Watch. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. This is one of those moments that stuck out to me recently reviewing for this. Leviticus 5 verse 1 if you adjure somebody in the name of God, you, you have to answer. Like, you have to answer. You look it up, Leviticus 5, verse 1. Uh, by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And you remember that Hebrew idiom, that answer earlier? Uh, Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man, see it at the right hand of the power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Judgment language, not what you want to hear uh, from, the, from the Lord. And, and so... I just thought we needed to address some of that. Okay. Verse 69 through 75, G, uh, Peter is going to deny the Lord three times. He's immediately going to feel terrible at the very end of it. As soon as it happens, he went out and wept bitterly. Verse 75. Judas is going to feel bad. And Judas, in verses 3 through 10, is going to feel so bad about it. What does he do as his act of repentance or He's going to hang himself. The book of Acts says he died by falling headlong and everyone's ate dinner, I hope, and the bowels gushed out. I mean, I just put those two together. He hung himself and 
rope probably snapped, and that's all, how it all happened together. Uh, Peter weeps bitterly and, you know, recommits himself when Jesus three times says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? So Peter does it the right way. It's called godly sorrow leading to uh, repentance that leads to salvation, 2 Corinthians 7. A little side devotional there. Okay, so uh, let's, let's read a little bit about, I do want to read verse 3, though. Uh, verse 3 of chapter 27. Then when Judas' betrayer saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. See to it, see uh, what is that to us, see to it yourself. This is really, again, shady and corrupt. What's happening, I call it picking and choosing what scriptures you want to follow. Uh, I don't think, perhaps Judas didn't really think that Jesus would be killed, um, because uh, about what's going to happen later on, he feels bad for it. They said we can't, the Old Testament basically says we can't have this, this money, Deuteronomy 21, verse 22, if you want to study that. We, we can't have all this money, and, and we, uh, uh, we're going to use it to buy, let me just read what it says, to buy, they're going to buy a, a field with it. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, verse 5, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, it is not lawful, uh, to put them in the treasury since it is blood money. That's Deuteronomy 23, verse 18. And he took counsel and brought with them, bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Talked about in the book of Acts, by the way. Therefore, the field has been called the field of blood to this day. Jesus would go before Pilate. This is now between 6.30 to 8.30 a.m. It's been an all-night affair. It's been, it's been rough. And now it's 6.30 to 8.30 approximately in the morning. And Jesus, uh, verse 11, stands before the governor. And the governor asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says again, third time we've seen this type of answer, you have said so, a very affirmative type answer. And in verse 12, and you could look at Luke 23's account, he gets these ridiculous charges. And he's like, I'm not going to answer this. He, and prophets say he wouldn't give an answer. Verse 14, not even to a single charge. And they're greatly amazed that he's not giving a response to this. Now, Luke 18... John 18, Jesus does say a few more things like, my kingdom is not of this world, if my, and, and he gives a little bit more context. But to all the charges, he doesn't, he doesn't respond to them. In verses 15 through 23 of Matthew 27, you have the crowd going to be choosing Barabbas, this insurrectionist, this murderer over Jesus. Uh, Pilate and believes this man to be innocent. He, he believes it to be innocent. His wife has a bad dream here in a minute. He says, hey, don't, don't do this, honey. honey. It's probably something along those lines. I don't know if that was uh, the little sweet words that were used then, but uh, don't, don't do it, Pilate, okay? And, and, uh, and he, he's like, okay, what creative way can I get myself out of this pickle without creating, getting this riot to calm down too? I don't like this. I, I'm kind of, I want to keep this thing under control, under wraps. Uh, we even skipped the whole part in Luke 23 where Jesus was sent to Herod and then sent back to Pilate, and now their relationship's going pretty good again. They're going steady again, and then all of a sudden, he's like, I got to keep this down. So what are my options here? Oh, I got a creative one. What if I, as my custom, I'll give an option? There's this notorious prisoner, verse 16, named Barabbas, super bad guy. Surely they're not going to want him released instead of Jesus, whom they, who says he's king of the Jews. I mean, the worst thing he's done is in their estimation blasphemed, which was punishable by death, blaspheming, but um, we believe him to be the son of God, so it wasn't blaspheming. And so uh, long story short, they pick Barabbas, and then he goes, in, what do I do with Jesus? Let him be crucified, let him be crucified, and Pilate washes his hands clean. Kind of a, some symbolism there. It's a, I believe they were all wrong in this scene. We actually had a whole quarter here once called the cast of the cross, and we spent a lot of time talking about Pilate a couple uh, years ago, and there were a lot, everyone's wrong in this scene right here. Uh, verse 25, this is powerful. Look at this. Verse 25, and the people answered. I don't even know that they realize what they're saying. His blood be on us and on our children. Do they realize what he said they're saying? That, that's a literal prophecy that the blood of Christ needs to come upon them and their children to wash them of their, their sins. Uh, Caiaphas would say something similar to this too. Uh, then they released for them uh, Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And just kind of, just, we just read verse 26 like that. 
And there's so much that happens in one sentence. It's, it's just tragic. Um, Jesus is mocked, verses 27 through 31. They strip him. They put a scarlet robe on him. They, uh, he says he's king of the Jews. So they twist together a crown of thorns, probably not little, little thorns, probably very inch long, thick thorns. And then when they put it on him, they give him a, a, a reed in his right hand. They mock him saying, hell, king of the Jews. Then they take the reed and they strike him, likely pushing the, the crown of thorns. And it's just horrible. It's a horrible scene uh, that's all taking place right here. And they're, they're mocking him and they're fulfilling prophecy. Isaiah 53, verses 3 and as well as verse 7. They, they don't, I don't even think they realize that, that 700 years before this, Isaiah told us about what was happening. And it's happening. It's happening right then and there. The crucifixion. As he's going, he has to get some help, as we understand, carrying this cross. Uh, there's a man of Cyrene, that's North Africa. Simon, by name, compelled this man to, help, to carry his cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, or in Latin, cal Calvary. Uh, Old Testament talked about executions being done outside of the city. That's why this would be happening. Numbers 15, verse 35. Uh, they would offer him like a, like a painkiller type drink, uh, offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. And when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Uh, and when he, uh, they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Again, all this was talked about a thousand years before in Psalm 22. A thousand years before, during the time of David, it's talked about. And they sat down and kept watch over him. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. In three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, um, Latin, right? And those three languages. And then it doesn't talk about it here. They didn't like that. They were like, no, this man said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate should have put his foot down earlier. He says, no, it's what, it, what I wrote. It's what it's going to be. Uh, and then uh, what happens, he's talking about a being killed with, as a common criminal. That was prophecy. Isaiah 53, verse 12. You have two robbers being crucified with them. And both of them are making fun of Jesus too. One of them gets, you know, comes to terms with what's going on and changes his mind. And Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. But two robbers are with them. And people are passing by and, and wagging their heads. Again, prophecy talked about way before this. And, and they, they're mocking him saying, you said you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. And the chief priests, you know, they're like, hey, he saved himself, which they don't deny. Uh, I mean, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Let me just, well, I keep saying we're going to skip. But there's so much good stuff here. Uh, in verse 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those who are listening think he's calling for who? Elijah. And they're like, ah, oh, go get him something to drink. And the other's like, no, 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 let's see if Elijah really comes. What's happening? We're, they're kind of doing like one last test to see if Jesus does something cool. Because they think he's supposed to be like the, the king who's kicking out all the Romans and reigning right there in Jerusalem. They got this miss, a little confused view of what the Messiah is supposed to be. And they're like, what's this way? And, but really, there's so much to that one sentence, that one question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he's quoting is, years later when Matthew would be written, and 2,000 years later when we read this, we should be taken back to Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting what's happening in the mind of, uh, what's going on in his mind during this moment is all explained in Psalm 22. Just read that, and that's what's going on in the mind of Christ at the same time that this is happening. So he's bringing us back to a, a prophecy a thousand years prior. And so uh, he's going to die. He's going to say different things like, it is finished, forgive them for they know not what they do. What are some other ones? I thirst. Um, <laughs> woman, your son, your son, <laughs> your, your mother. And he, he does like seven, seven different things he says there on the cross. He dies. And he's buried, verse 57. He's buried in a rich man's tomb. This would be the rich man, verse 57, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus. He would be given a very proper, good burial. He would be put into a brand new tomb. There would be a, a, a large, great stone rolled in front of his tomb. People were there, Mary Magdalene. Others were there watching what happened when he got, was put into the tomb. 
uh, this would be a day would be skipped in between you, the day of preparation, then they would come back on, on, uh, on another day. But the, the tomb was given the, uh, let's see, the seal. Pilate, Pilate let them have a guard, and he sealed it with a, to, um, with, with a seal of approval, saying, don't you dare mess with this. You don't try to roll this stone away. Uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse 7 says the same thing pretty much to the Roman seal on the stone where Daniel was. And so nobody could change Daniel's sentence in that scene. And, uh, and by the way, do you think Pilate really wanted this whole thing? Do you think he wanted Jesus to come back to life at this moment? I don't think so. And do you think he wanted the disciples to come and steal the body? I don't think so because there was so much chaos already. He's like, whew, I feel bad for him, but he's, kind, you know, he's gone now. Now I can get back, back to normal, you know, <laughs> try to get things back to normal. Uh, Jesus is going to rise on the third day, on the first day of the week. Um, now after, well, I'll just show it to you from here. This is the best part, last few minutes. Here's the real lesson. That was the intro, okay? <laughs> the death and the burial and the resurrection. Just a few thoughts here. The reason we need to talk about this is the tomb is empty, and there has to be some sort of explanation. Because I even, I think I was talking about this past Sunday, I had a list of like talking about the different world religions and their leaders. And then the, the last column was, where are their bodies today? And all their bodies are in tombs today. And it's like, okay, what about Jesus? Well, Jesus is, isn't there. You kind of, some people can say, well, this is likely where he was. He was buried, but there's no body in there anymore because we understand that he came back to life and then ascended, which Corey will talk about more tomorrow. And so there's this empty tomb that does require explanation, even if you don't believe um, that Jesus really came back to life. M most honest people, even skeptics, this is a whole other study, will at least acknowledge that there was someone named Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, that's even proven with non-believers, non uh, like non-Christians, even uh, people who weren't uh, even Jewish, just other contemporary writers believe there was a person named Jesus of Nazareth. And he did die. That's all agreed upon. That's even written in secular type writings as well as Jewish writings. But there has to be an explanation. If we don't believe he came back to life, there's only two options. He either came back to life or he didn't come back to life. This is a good quote. Uh, I won't read it all, but from Josh McDowell's book, uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He basically gives the two options. It's either a hoax or it's the greatest historical event. There's no like in between. Okay, so it's very important what our, we believe about the resurrection. And so the importance of the resurrection is that it is the part of the gospel. If you have the, everything we just read about the death and the burial of a really cool person named Jesus, it's just another, it would just be a really neat story and a very coincidental story that this guy did all these fulfillments of things written a long time before him, but he still died in the end. And then without this third element, this third component, it doesn't make, it just makes him in the list of other really fascinating people in history. But because he taught all these things and he wasn't lying about what he said, he actually proved it was true and then he came back to life and because there's a resurrection, it changes everything. I mean, I had a list in case I didn't have enough information to say, which I'm not going to get to it, I can tell you that now, uh, of just really good quotes about the resurrection. Like, what are your thoughts about the resurrection? And because the resurrection happened, it changes everything. It changes everything. The gospel defines, is defined as Jesus being raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That was prophesied too. Uh, there's this whole what if game. In 1 Corinthians 15 and one through, uh, 12 through 20, there's this big what if game. Like what if Jesus didn't come back to life? What if there was no resurrection? Paul goes, what if? Well, if he, if he wasn't raised from the dead, then, then guess what? Then Christ, you know, he's not raised. Where is he? Where, where's he at? And by the way, if Jesus hasn't, had been raised, then your faith uh, and our preaching is in vain. Everything we're talking about, everything you believe, their whole lifestyle and why you do what you do and the way you structure your life and the decisions you make and all your whole belief system is, is shattered. If there is no resurrection, everything that we do in our preaching and our teaching in your faith is, is empty. It's vain and it's meaningless. It means that everyone you love and care about who's died, they're not going to be risen. That's it. I mean, once you die, that's it. Maybe you can believe some other worldview or philosophy, but you know, th <laughs> this whole idea that our founder proved that there's life after death is very meaningful to us now. People who die, that's not the end. There's more to life than this. Uh, he also goes on to say, uh, you are still in your sins because when you're baptized into Christ, 
Your sins are washed away and you rise in a newness of life, Romans 6, verse 3. And that would mean nothing if there is no resurrection, meaning you coming out of the water is just coming out of like a bathtub. It means nothing. It means you just got wet. But because Jesus came back to life, he proves that you rise in a new, new person. And so the, there's this what if game that's explained in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And Jesus talked about it. He said like a number of times, not only was he going to be crucified, but guess what? He would, he would come back. And he quotes uh, in Matthew 12, verse 40, for just as Jonah was three days, three nights, in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, the pre-resurrection scene, I've already made a few, I read this verse a moment ago, uh, where you have Joseph Arimathea, he's going to ask for the body of Jesus and it's going to be given to him, and he's going to be given a really, really nice burial. You don't, why, well, I don't want to say too much now, but why would you want to mess with that? A great burial he got. And uh, he's, get, he's bound up in strips of linen with spices as the custom of the Jews. You had this stone, which some of the ancient manuscripts sometimes add commentary, kind of like, you know, it, this is an ancient manuscript, but it would be like people writing commentary of like second, third generation uh, people who were contemporary of those type of preachers. And it, they had things like usually required several men to remove it or a stone that took 20 men uh, to move. The seal, that was that, that Roman seal that Pilate put on there, meaning don't you mess with it or you're going to die, in other words. Uh, guards, by the way, if a guard let somebody get in or get out, what would happen to that guard? <laughs> yeah, you remember, you remember Acts 16, earthquake and he went what he's what's jailer's about to do what about to kill himself he knows he's about to die and then well whole nother story paul says don't do that and preaches the gospel to him the post-resurrection scene so jesus comes back in between this and whenever they find out the disciples like peter and john they hear about this resurrection happening and they take off to the tomb now john's a younger man he'll be around all the way to revelation until the island of patmos and jesus told him you'd be around for a long time my assumption is he's a lot, well, he's faster than Peter, and he gets there, and he stops, and he looks in, and sees the clothes all folded up, and all that, and then finally Peter catches up and runs straight into the tomb and sees, wow, where the, the linen cloths were lying there, and the face cloth uh, separate and all folded up. Jesus would make a lot of appearances. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. He appeared then to the 12, the apostles. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at a time. Uh, this would be good if I had my detective clothes on. There are little clues here we're going to point out in a moment. Uh, most of whom were still alive by the time 1 Corinthians was written. Uh, Though some have fallen asleep, meaning they, they died. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. He appeared to many people, Mary Magdalene, different scenes, the other women at the tomb, the two Emmaus disciples on the road walking with Thomas. He would appear later on. Ten apostles at one time, uh, seven at the Lake of Tiberias, 120 to Stephen and to John at Patmos. Many appearances. Okay, so what does that mean? Did the resurrection really happen? All right, so we have to, we think for a minute, say we just put on our devil's advocate hat on for a moment. What if that resurrection didn't happen? Well, I need to come up with a valid alternative explanation. So what are the alternatives? And it's good to consider these because it can be faith building whenever you learn how to respond to them. Okay, what are, the, what are the theories that could be out there? Just in a minute version of each one. The swoon theory, meaning, well, he never actually died. He just appeared to be dead. He was knocked out. He was unconscious. Even the spear to the side and the blood and water coming out didn't really faze him. He, he wasn't really dead. Well, okay, that might sound good. And mm, I don't want to get into it. There's another major world religion who actually takes that theory about Jesus. Um, but anyways, the refutation. It's, uh, sorry, my clicker's not working. Jesus died according to the judgments of Roman soldiers who killed lots and lots of people by crucifixion. They assumed he was dead. They broke the legs of two uh, beggars on each side of him. They went to break the legs and realized, wait, he's already dead. Uh, Joseph believed he was dead when he took the body and gave him a burial. Nicodemus, same thing. Jesus' disciples believed him to be, to be dead. Uh, Jesus would have had to do what we call like a Harry Houdini thing. He's already wrapped up in lin uh, those linen cloths, uh, bound up, and, and be able to bust out of that, I assume would be difficult, even at full strength, 
let alone a scourging and a, and a, and a, and a hanging on a tree. Uh, Jesus rolled back then that large stone that, remember the ancient manuscript said, sometimes took 20 people to roll, and he had to roll it from the inside out, which that doesn't make sense either. Uh, let me see what else we could say here. Um, he had to walk, he walked, remember with the two Emmaus disciples, they walked seven miles, it tells us. That means he walked seven miles right after this, this supposed uh, death of his that never really happened. That means Jesus, everything he said about his crucifixion and about his resurrection was a lie. Everything he said was a lie. Uh, then how do you, uh, oh, here's a good one. How then do you explain then his, then, uh, his real death? Like how did he really die then? If he didn't really die then, he had to die some other way. And if he didn't die, he just kind of disappeared. Well, give it, you still need another explanation for the death of Jesus, how it really occurred, and, and then, or why did he disappear, and how did he suddenly disappear? So it doesn't make a lot of sense. The theft theory is the idea that the disciples came and stole the body, which if we had finished Matthew, I thought we've read that for 40 minutes, so I figured I'd just summarize it now, that uh, this was the lie. This was the big lie. Uh, I think I even have it typed up, Matthew 28, 11 through 15. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And then they assembled with the elders and took the council. They gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. They should have killed the soldiers, number one. That's what you're supposed to do when somebody gets out. But they gave them money instead. And said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole away the body while they, we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day, about 50, 55 AD. And, and even to this day, that's the idea. His body was stolen by his disciples. Makes no sense. A couple reasons why. How would you explain the disciples fleeing Jesus when he was being taken, going back to their own fishing trades and doing their own thing, not even believing when they first hear about the resurrection, are you serious? Uh, to all of a sudden dying for their faith, dying for this idea that Jesus did come back alive. Soldiers were not sleeping because they would have been woken up by the noise <laughs> if you're rolling a big stone. How do you explain when somebody breaks in? Typically, I haven't stole anything in a while. Well, I guess hopefully I've never broken into someone's home and done my thing. Normally, I don't do the laundry. You know what I mean? You don't leave the, do the laundry. You, you get in, you get out. I believe that's how it goes. Okay. Uh, the, the grave clothes are folded nicely. Jesus had a nice burial. Why in the world would the Jews, the disciples, want to take the body if he already had a very nice burial? It makes no sense. And I don't believe the disciples still were expecting Jesus' resurrection. They thought it was the gardener. They thought it was his ghost and things like that. But you looked at other verses. And all the Jews would have to do then, if that was really what happened, is find the real Jesus, find the real Yeshua of Nazareth, and show people that this is the real body of Jesus and on day four. You know, just start with day four and on. You can just show it. Okay, that's all you got to do. It, it doesn't, yeah, I already talked about that. All right, so, and by the way, Pilate didn't want this mess. He just wanted to stop, okay? Last, uh, last few things, the hallucination theory that everybody was just hallucinating all at the same time. For, for two people to have the same hallucination at one time is super unlikely according to the laws of psychiatry, but for 500 people to have the same hallucination at the same time, or 120 or seven or 10, the, the two Emmaus disciples, all of those ones that have the same hallucination it's not consistent at all with even psychiatry laws and all that. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, Luke talks about infallible proofs the whole time in Acts. It was undeniable. And then lastly, the wrong tomb theory. That the disciples, when they ran to the tomb, John went first and then Peter, they all ran to the wrong tomb. That's what happened. And so really all you got to do is now go find the real tomb. And hey, there's, we all went to the wrong one, guys. Joseph, you're, the, oh, here's the refutation right here. It's, it's uh, women had been there less than 72 hours before. They were watching. They were ready. They wanted to, they even had some more preparations. If you read one of the accounts, they still wanted to do. Matthew 27, verse 61. Peter ran, uh, John ran straight to the tombs. Like they knew exactly where to go of all things. Uh, an angel said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And if so, the Jews just had to go to the right tomb and say, oh guys, you're in the wrong one. And Joseph, sorry, you're mistaking your tomb, by the way. It's actually this one. He's like, no, my tomb's over here. I know my tomb. It's mine. Uh, it, all they had to do was go to the real one and show it. And um, it's not a public cemetery. It was, a, it was a, private, a private one. And so whatever theory you can come up with, whatever alternative, uh, according to Scripture, it doesn't, doesn't bear any weight. There's plenty of ways to respond that the resurrection, resurrection happened. 
And because it happened, it changes everything. There's a death, there's a burial and a resurrection. We can believe that gospel, we can die, we can be buried, and we can rise in newness of life. And, and the whole story from beginning to end of creation to when the Lord returns, it all makes sense. It all flows together. It all connects. There's this plan, this a scheme of redemption, if you will, from beginning to end that all just fits perfectly together. It's because God did it. God planned it. God orchestrated it. And God works it. Any um, closing comments or questions or concerns or complaints? <laughs> Complaint? Okay. Oh. Correct. Yeah. Then when the water and the blood came out, that only happens to someone who would have been dead. Any other comments? Yes, David. And then I'll go back over here. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, would, that would happen uh, with that, the rich man Lazarus discussion. And they're like... They have Moses, they have the prophets. It's just like us, really. Uh, it, it, us who haven't seen and yet believed. How much better that's even. If we didn't actually see it. We're 2,000 years removed from it, but we can still believe it even though we weren't there literally to see it. The whole Thomas account. Uh, I heard of something. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and he even said, you have guards. You go, you go seal it, make it secure. And they did that. So it, was, it was their people. That's, I didn't even bring that out. It was the Jewish guards, the Jews' guards. And then he just gave the stamp of approval and the seal on it and say, I'm backing this effort here. So, yeah, that's even more testimony of that. <laughs> um, absolutely, yeah. And, and after it happens, um, many Romans do become Christians, thankfully. <laughs> Well, yeah. Oh, I guess the Romans would have killed the guards because that's why it says if it gets to their ears, hey, we'll back you up. We got you. And, then, and so it's just all shady. You know, it's all corrupt there. Any other comments? All right, let's, uh, let's close with a prayer and then I got to go put a costume on and get ready.